Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I, I, this is definitely the first time, maybe the only time in my life, that I'm in the functional programming track. That is definitely a, a first. So uh, it's exciting um, because often, uh, the, on, honestly, um, functional languages have not really, functional programming has not really been on the menu for me as a system software programmer. Um, it kind of actually entered the menu, ironically enough, with JavaScript. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I, I really, I mean, I, yes, my degree is in computer science, um, so there's no real excuse for this. But I didn't really appreciate or learn functional programming until implementing in JavaScript in 2006. So um, I, hopefully I'm, I'm in kind of a safe space where I can confess that to you. Um, but, um, and actually, it was funny. For those of you who, who, who weren't around at that time, it was kind of a weird time because um, the, we had this thing called AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, worst acronym ever. Like, you can't have one of the letters be a conjunction, another be an abbreviation. I mean, anyway, terrible, terrible um, idea, or a good idea, but a terrible abbreviation, terrible acronym. Um, and a bunch of us kind of simultaneously were waiting in the JavaScript in like 2005, 2006, because we were trying to actually build these like interesting programs on the browser and discovering like, oh my God, there's a real language here in terms of JavaScript. It's not just for blink tags. I can actually do interesting things. And I, I actually was like, oh my God, I, I, I actually, I, I'm learning what a closure is. I am actually, I am appreciating a lambda. I'm actually appreciating this stuff. So um, that was great. Um, but, uh, and JavaScript has been great, but, um, and we, we've used it at Joint for a bunch of, of different reasons. But the, the, the truth is that in the deeper parts of system software, we have not really had that kind of power, that, that programmatic power. We've really been kind of stuck. And um, I think we're about to get unstuck. And I want to kind of explain what, what I'm seeing there. Uh, I want to talk first about, uh, about platform values and software values. Because the older I get, um, the more I believe that, that values are really core to the decisions that we make. So wh what do I mean by, by values? So values are positive traits that you are choosing amongst. So we all, there are lots of kind of positive things, but our own individual values will dictate when, if we, when we have to choose between two things, how we actually make that choice. And different platforms make that choice differently. And too often, I think that we look at the different choices that a different platform has made, and we, we will criticize those choices or we will embrace those choices. But what we're actually doing is we are commenting on our own values relative to the values, perhaps, of a different system. So our own values are really important. And the values that we have shift based on what we're doing where when. Um, we don't have necessarily one set of values for all of the software we write. We got different software we write, we will have different values and we want our software to, to reflect those values. And I think that actually in the, in the kind of the post open source world, when we are selecting a programming language, when we are looking at a programming language, when we are looking at a software platform, we should be looking as much at values as we are at anything else. Do the values here reflect the values that I want for this thing, especially when community is so important. I mean, in an open source world, you're selecting community as much as you're selecting anything else. And I've learned this the hard way, where you've got to, because if you like, I love the technology, ah, eh, the community, I've got kind of issues with, but I really love the technology. If the community doesn't reflect your values, you will find that the software will come to not reflect your values as well. So you, you really need, need to, to find the right community for the values, the right values then for, for the job, the right software for the values. So let, let's kind of make this a little more specific here. So this is just kind of a, scattering of random values. Um, these are, this is not a very well organized list. I'm not even, I guess it's alphabetical. I guess I did make it alphabetical. Um, other than that, it's not really sorted. It's not meant to be exhaustive. There are lots more values than this. Um, and each of these values kind of mean different things to different people. So there's, there's a lot of nuance here, but we can kind of generally agree what it means to have performance as a value, or what it means to have robustness as a value, or debuggability as a value, or composability as a value, or expressiveness as a value. And you can't have it all. You can't choose all of these things. We can all agree that each of these things is important. I don't think any of us would say that that value is just garbage and you should never want it, right? I mean, for, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's some things up here. But I think that in general, we would say, you know, all of these things are important. They're good. They have their place. But the real question is, when you have to make a choice between two of them, what do you choose? And those, what, that choice that you make, you being a software platform, a language, 
a community. That choice reflects the core values of that, that platform or language. And you can't have every value be a core value. So what, what are the core values um, of some of these things? Because these things are in tension. Um, and I think that they, they do, uh, w when you have these core values, they, they're going to attract like-minded folks. And as a result, they become self-reinforcing um, because those who are attracted to those values are attracted to the software, and then they want to defend those values in the software. They want those values to remain consistent. So they, they, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy here. So let's look at, at C's values. So kind of grade out the values that they don't have. Um, and C, you know, the, the history of, of C is, is pretty interesting. Um, we, we tend to think of C and Unix as being identical twins born at the same moment, kind of in the birth canal at the same time. That's not actually the case. Um, Unix was actually uh, developed before C, if slightly. Um, Unix was developed originally all in assembly. Um, and there was, an opera, there was a language called B that was kind of floating around, but they didn't really use B for very much. B was slow. Um, so B was used for some ancillary parts of the operating system, and they, they saw the need to develop a, a higher level language, a, a structured language, although the higher level came first, um, that would allow them to not have to implement the operating system in assembly. That is the, the birthplace of C, is we want effectively a better assembly. We want a non-machine specific assembly, and that's what C is. C is effectively portably assemble, portable assembly. The A number one goal of C is, is performance. And I add interoperability there as well. Because it is just models the machine, C is designed to interoperate with anything that can execute on the machine effectively. So C interoperates with assembly. It can interoperate with effectively anything that is going to actually operate on the machine. So interoperability is very important. Portability is very important. And then simplicity. One of the things that's interesting about C is C only grew those things that were needed to implement Unix. So they didn't add structures to Unix or to C until they realized they needed them to implement Unix. So C originally didn't have structures. Seems like, like what, do you, what does C have if it doesn't have structures? It seems like it has precious, precious little. But assembly doesn't have structures, so why would you? And then like, you know what? Structures would make this a lot easier. So they added structures, OK. But they kind of stopped there. Um, and C has retained that minimalist aesthetic, which I think is very core to, to C's values. So this is what I would say C's values are. And it's not that C doesn't care about these other things. It's just that it deliberately, if it has to make a choice between these, or when it had to make a choice between these, these are the ones that, that it chose. And admittedly, C is also in a time when a lot of these things are, are, are much more profound tension. Performance and expressiveness, for example, were very much in tension, and they, they chose performance. Um, just, I just throw this, as long as you're doing one letter languages in terms of B and C, might as well throw K in there. Um, it's got nothing to do with system software. I don't know if people know K. Um, K and Q, its follow on, um, were developed by a guy named Arthur Whitney, um, who is uh, definitely on like a different astral plane. Um, so uh, Arthur believes that the Arthur's aesthetic is all around minimalism and expressiveness. Um, Arthur, <laughs> Arthur learned APL from Ken Iverson at age four. I'm not making this up. He was like Ken Iverson's neighbor. And further, Arthur has the belief, which I admire and I love, and I, I mean, I, I don't want to like, I, I don't want to talk him out of this belief, that he can teach any four-year-old APL. Now, when he told me this, I had a four-year-old that I knew for a fact could not be taught APL. I mean, I, the, the, and, and he's like, you should bring your four-year-old, and I will teach them APL. I'm like, this is going to end poorly for everybody, because uh, you are not going to be able to teach him APL, and he's going to be very upset having to learn APL. I said, this is not going to end well. I'm not, not, not going to call this bluff. But I, I, I admire the beauty of a brain that believes that APL can be taught to a four-year-old. That's, that's amazing to me. Um, but K's only values are in that expressiveness. Arthur wants to write a program, and it's, it's, I guess it's not funny, I should say it without laughing, in as few characters as possible. I mean, th that is what beauty is to Arthur. Fewest number of characters. I don't know if he feels he's going to be biblically punished for the number of characters he uses. I don't quite understand what drives that, but that's what drives that. And, and he will make code denser and denser and denser and denser. Is it readable? 
It is emphatically not readable, and it looks like, you know, from if you're of my vintage, it looks like your mom picked up the phone when you were on the modem, and you get like a bunch of line noise. Like, that's like compilable K, I think. Um, but it's beautiful. All right, so that's, and, but these are the only values. Like, don't care, we definitely don't care about like, maintainability, readability, uh, no, don't care. What we care about is expressiveness and performance. That's it, performs very, very well, um, and um, used often um, uh, for market facing kind of operations. Uh, I just kind of throw this in there for another one that's, that, that's kind of clarifying, you know, OpenBSD, the operating system, security, end of core values. Um, the, there is no other core value in OpenBSD in that, and, that, and that, that's not, I'm not being pejorative. Um, it's actually incredibly clarifying when you have a system that is so upfront and transparent about this is what we care about. And we don't care if, it, if we're going to make the system much slower to make it secure, that's what we're going to do. If, if we need to turn off hyperthreading because we believe that hyperthreading is unsafe at any speed, that's what we're going to go do. And you're going to lose half your virtual cores, but too bad they were never secure. They were always vulnerable to side channel attacks, which is all true, actually. That's all that's, that's a totally reasonable, if extreme, position, an admirable position. This is what OpenBSD cares about, and, and more power to them. Um, I, just, I love awk, got to throw awk in there. Um, just to give you kind of some different examples. Um, awk is really about like how, writing programs quickly. Um, I write, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I write awk on a daily basis. I write three or four awk programs a day. Like I just, and these are one-liners, right? These are super quick programs, but awk is really beautiful in that, that I can write something super quickly. It's very simple. Um, it's pretty expressive as these things go. You can do a lot with a little in awk. It's very approachable. You can get anyone to the, uh, if you've read the awk programming language, so awk named because of Aho, um, Weinberger, and Kernigan, the, the three people that invented it. Um, the awk programming language, I think, is an absolute model of programming language documentation. So you, you get the awk programming language. It's like 130 pages, the book. It's beautifully written, beautifully typeset. You'll read it in like two hours, and then you're done. Like, that's it. You know all of Auk. There's, there, there's nothing more to know about Auk. Like, you actually learned it all, the end. Um, and it's, th there's something that is great and beautiful about that. It's simple, it's approachable, and so on. I think you might be able to teach a four-year-old Auk. Maybe. You know, that's crazy. You can't do that. I, I, but maybe a seven-year-old. Um, okay, now I have never written a line of Scala, so if you like, if, if you like rush the stage because this is wrong, um, I'm sorry. That's why I put a question mark there to try to reason with the mob as they were throwing chairs at me. Um, so um, I, 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 I'm not necessarily asserting this, but it is to kind of like try this on. And I think it's a useful exercise to think about, like what are the core values for the things that I implement in, the things that are important to me, because that's probably why they're important to you. That's probably why you gravitate to them at some level. Um, and what I see in Scala is certainly um, expressiveness, right? It obviously, is, is very important. I think you've got to put interoperability way, way, way up there. I mean, the whole point of Scala is to be able to interact with the Java ecosystem at large. That's a very core principle. To me, that's a core value. I mean, I remember actually seeing what I think must have been one of Martin's very first talks on Scala um, back in, I think, like 2004. Um, and the, it, this was a big deal, the ability to reuse Java classes um, in a language that provided integrity and robustness and expressiveness and composability. I, and I'm not saying that Scala doesn't care about the things that, that aren't bolded here, but just if it has to choose, this is what Scala is going to choose. I thought it was really interesting for those of you who saw the panel last night where Martin was being asked, you know, wh what is your kind of vision for Scala going forward? And it wants to make it easier to write robust programs. It's really about writing robust software. Um, and I thought it was interesting, too, that eliminating some of the things <laughs> like the XML literals. Um, I did not know they had XML literals. But eliminating some of the things that we no longer need because they're not going to serve these values. I'm not sure where XML literals fall on the values. Uh, and I, the, 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 moving right along. Um, OK, so the, 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 the challenge for, that we have in system software that is not necessarily a challenge that you might have in the software that you're writing, but in the, in, in the, software, in the system software, that is beneath you or beneath us. That is, that, that is, that is say, it, it comprises the, the, the foundation upon which we build. The values are dictated by those who will use the software. It's dictated by the expectations. Like the, the, an operating system that, for example, does not hold of the values around, say, robustness or safety or, or security, 
Th that operating system is one that is not long for this universe because you're not going to want to use it. No one wants to have an operating system that panics on them. No one wants to have an operating system, and our expectations for the operating system and for system software are very, very, very high, and rightfully so. They should be high. Um, and so, and in particular, if there are certain values that if your system software doesn't have it, your software can't have it. Uh, and we are learning this the hard way because these values go even deeper into security, right? I mean, 2018 has been my Annus Horribilis because of, and it was, it was on you know, January 2nd of 2018, um, when I'm looking at this hacker news story, that someone trying to kind of reverse engineer some patches that are being floated against the Linux kernel, thinking there may be a really serious security vulnerability here um, with Intel, and then you realize, and that was the beginning of the end for my 2018, because 2018 has taught us that, that security wa was ultimately subservient to performance in the design of the microprocessor. And we were all complicit in that, by the way. Like, let's not, it's easy to kind of like blame Intel for that, but the reality was we were all complicit in that. That's what we demanded. The problem is we discovered that that, th that very lowest substrate because it tr chose performance over security at some very key and implicit junctures, we ended up with a substrate that's self above it in the operating system and system software that now lost security as a value. It doesn't matter how much, how dear you hold security if you have hyper-threading enabled. doesn't matter because the, because the hyper-threading itself is not secure. Um, or it, it doesn't matter if, if you don't have kernel page table isolation. It doesn't matter how dear you hold it, because now you are vulnerable to an attack but from a, a substrate that ultimately chose something else over, over security. And this is very painful for us. It's very painful when, you're, when, when the, the infrastructure, the layer that you depend on, because we all depend on layers beneath us, when the layer that kind of a jack-in-the-box, hey, surprise! I don't hold the values you thought I held. It's like, okay, well, I guess I will cancel what I was going to do for 2018 and spend the time getting the system back to where I thought it was on, on December 31st, 2017, um, which is what we have effectively done. It's been, it's been very frustrating in that regard. Um, but that's, uh, for system software, um, we have to hold these values. Um, it, is, it is essential. So these are the values that we demand of system software. Um, it's got to be compatible, right? You, you're not going to, an upgrade to a microprocessor, to an operating system, to a database, when that breaks your software, that's not okay. It's got to be debuggable. We have to understand what's going on, why things are failing. You've got to have integrity as a core value. You can't have data corruption. Um, you need performance. I really wish we could just like, can we just get rid of performance? And then it'll be, it'll be fine. If we don't need performance, you know, a, the, the, the late, great Roger Faulkner, who I worked with at Sun Microsystems for a long time, would said that performance is the root of all evil. Um, and, and he's right, performance is the root of all evil. If we are, are, are happy with our systems not performing well, things get a lot easier. Um, but of course, that's not, we don't want to do that, right? Performance is important. Performance drives right to the economics of what we're doing. It's not okay to be wasting cycles that we don't need to waste. We actually have to have performance as a constraint. And this can be brutal, by the way, especially when the numbers are small. It's like, man, this thing is like 2% faster than you guys. You're just like, oh God, that 2% is brutal to get out of. But it's important, and it should be important. It's important that we hold that value for our system software. It's gotta be resilient, it's gotta be robust, it's gotta be safe, it's gotta be secure. We, that, that's, it, uh, it's paramount that it's secure, it needs to be stable. It's gotta be thorough in that, our system software, our microprocessors, our operating systems, even our databases, we need them to support a wide range of things. They, they, these are not purpose-built things. We can't afford for them to be purpose-built things. They have to be generic. That genericism requires a thoroughness that is actually really challenging. Um, we gotta be transparent. We gotta be kind of the day of, of proprietary glop. Well, it was behind us and then that's actually, th this is coming back actually with the whole cloud thing. Um, so I'm moving for a cloud, cloud provider, although our software's all open source, but right now, uh, compute is being reproprietarized by, the, by the, the, the cloud providers. So transparency may be fading as a value. I hope that we go and demand it back again. Um, okay, so I just want to remind you what the platform, the, the core values of C are. So we're just gonna kind of do this. All right, so that's what we demand. That's C. What we demand, C is like right eye, left eye. Right eye, <laughs> left eye. Right eye, left eye. All right, there's only one value these things have in common. Performance, that's it. Everything else, and this is actually, and you know what, Roger, except Roger passed away a couple years ago. Roger, you are haunting us from the grave, because you are actually all right. Performance actually is the root of all evil here, um, because if it, 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 performance ultimately 
in terms of the values we demand for system software, we do demand performance over all else. That is the reality. We, we might not like that, but we cannot accept a system that is better in all of these other attributes, but suffers in terms of performance. And for, for evidence of that, just look at history's graveyard of systems that did deliver, and you will find people that, that talk about you know, capability-based systems, or microkernel-based systems, or other, other systems that ultimately fell down on this most important criteria. Um, and I say, I used to work for QNIC, so I love microkernels, so I'm not, I'm not trying to pick, uh, pick uh, at wounds, but um, performance ultimately is, is the most important thing. So that's C. C is clearly, I mean, we kind of got in there with C, but it's been really painful. Well, what about C++? All right, well, this is what I did for C++. So, <laughs> So C++, uh, okay, so we're definitely going to get rid of simplicity. I don't have a way of, there should be a way of like, I need a, a strikeout to be like, I hate simplicity. Like that's like, I am actually anti-simplicity, cross that one out. So, so C++ is like anti-simplicity. Um, and then I also decided that, again, in, in my uh, kind of, uh, as, as long as I'm issuing fatwas against programming languages, um, I, I I decided that expressiveness is important. Interoperability is actually less important to C++. Uh, C++ has actually made choices. Yes, C++ is a better C, and yes, I think it can still compile C, although that becomes less and less important over time. But it, the, C++ struggles with interoperability at a deeper level, where you have components that are written in non-C++ trying to cooperate with components that are written in C++. It is possible, but very, very painful. And C++ does not make it easy across the board. I mean, it starts with name mangling and gets much, much worse. Um, it's really, really painful to make software. Uh, it, it, you have to design your C++ to explicitly interoperate with C, which is very frustrating, because you have these software out there that's actually only in C++. So it can be very hard to actually get it to interoperate with C. So this gives us this, this, this tremendous divide, this tremendous disconnect um, between the values that, that the system software programming languages have had, namely performance and then nothing else, um, and the values that we need for the software. We have to have all these other values. Now, we've gotten there. Um, it's been a long, painful, arduous path. Um, the reality is our system software does work. It is actually, it does have all of these other values. It does, it is stable. It is, it is, I mean, it is relatively stable. It is relatively secure, or I thought it was secure on, on December 31st, 2017 anyway. Um, it is relatively safe, relatively robust, does perform well, um, but we've gotten there the painful way. It has taken us a very long time. We've written a lot of bespoke tooling. Now, we've also gotten very good at it. Um, I'm good at writing, my, my C does not, it is not going to dereference memory that it does not have. That is not a failure mode that I have in the C that I write because I've been doing this for a long time and I know how to malloc and free and I know how to create dynamic data structures and do that, do so completely safely and I can very quickly. That's good. It was very painful and the truth is it is very much dependent on me, the programmer, and my reviewers and my testing and so on. There's no net that is provided by the language at all. Um, the language is allowing me to do whatever I want. Um, it's, you know, it, it's like a Montessori preschool as long as we all worship at the, older, or at the altar of performance. Um, so the, you know, the, the question is like, can we do better? Um, because we've succeeded despite the language, not because of it. Uh, is there an opportunity to do better? And I was actually at the point um, where I was beginning to despair a little bit where I had, and yes, there are other languages that have come out. Um, you may be familiar with Joint because of Node.js. Um, I had this like uh, great belief that Node.js was gonna be what would save us all. Um, yeah, and if, and hi, if you're being like, no, that's just JavaScript. I'm like, I know, I know, it's just JavaScript. But I wanted so much better. I wanted so much better for JavaScript. It wasn't gonna be JavaScript. It was gonna be a dynamic language in which we could write robust server-side software. It's just JavaScript. It's just JavaScript, dude. Uh, it is just JavaScript. And, and what I mean by that is the values that JavaScript has aren't bad values, but they are not the values that we have for system software. The values that JavaScript has is really around velocity and especially approachability. We want as many people as possible to be able to write JavaScript. And that is not, that's a, that's a great ambition. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that value. It is antithetical to system software because that does become intention. And it's like if we want to choose an abstraction, that allows 10,000 more people to write software, but that software will be rife with edge conditions that they will probably never encounter, should we do it? If your first value is robustness, you say, no, of course not. 
If your first value is, is approachability and, and growth, then yes, of course you should. And that is the fundamental tension for us. Um, so I wanted us to do better. Um, I, 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 was, I was beginning to despair because I, I didn't see a language that was, that was really offering fundamentally different values. Um, and then um, along came Rust. Um, and uh, now well, along came Rust. Rust has been around for a long time. Um, started actually a long, long, long time ago. Started in like 2006. Um, or, even, or just a little bit later, um, but Rust has kind of has grown over time, and I, like I think many people, have been increasingly Rust curious over the years, right? And my my Rust curiosity um, has has grown over the years because Rust has this incredibly interesting system of ownership, um, where whereby you are the the programmer are going to work with the compiler to figure out who owns what when. Who owns what piece of memory? The compiler is going to restrict what you do, and you're not going to burst in the tears when it does it. That's, like the, the, that's the bargain that you're going to have with the compiler. As a result, the compiler knows when things need to be allocated and when things need to be deallocated, when there, there is still a reference to this and when there is no longer a reference to it. And you're going to work with it, and as a result, you get the, dyna dy the dynamicism that you get in a garbage collected language but the performance of explicit memory management. And this is amazing. And importantly, unlike C, Rust is highly composable. So the big problem with C, I mean, this is always the problem, right? It's not, it's not you, it's the other person. Like, I know how to write memory, say, I know how to actually deal with memory safely, but calling you to a library, that jerk, no, they don't know how to deal with memory safely, or, but it's even worse than that, right? Because what, where things get dropped is in the boundary, is in the, the library is allocating something on your behalf that you are explicitly or implicitly expected to free or deallocate. You lose track of that, you've got a memory leak, memory corruption, or worse. It is very hard, even if you're very good at C and have been doing it your entire career, it's very hard to compose it. So what we end up doing is having these very minimal kind of structures where we we embed these things in larger structures, and we're able to do so totally safely, but ultimately suboptimally. Rust actually allows us to have higher performing primitives. And so as a result, and actually I'll, I'll come back to the, the Rust values, but in, in my experience, and this is my experience, I'm not trying to, to draw large conclusions, this is a bit, a bit of software that is what I was alluding to last night at the panel that I'd written in C, and I'd kind of written in, in you know, hand optimized C. I went to rewrite it in Rust because I was increasingly Rust curious and wanted to finally sate that Rust curiosity by writing some real Rust. Um, after a lot of back and forth with the compiler, some tears that I wiped away, um, do it, like let the Wookiee win is my advice when you're dealing with Rust. That the, you, you want to, Rust wants you to do things certain ways and you're much better off doing things the way Rust wants you to do it. So I did it in a way that was obviously suboptimal, but fine, I can get it to compile. I just got to the point where I'm like, I don't even care about performance anymore. Just let me get this thing working, and then, and I know it's going to perform terribly. And then I ran it, and it outperformed my C. It's like, what? How did that happen? How? And I took it apart, and how did it outperform my C? Well, this particular software spends all of its time rebalancing a binary tree, and in Rust, the, the primitive that I was using was an AVL tree, which is the thing we've used forever, and I've got a very robust AVL tree implementation that I've used. In Rust, you don't have an AVL tree, you actually have a B tree. B tree you may remember from databases, right? But the, the, the Rust observation is actually, with the memory hierarchy being what it is, a B tree actually makes sense just in software that's not talking to disk. You can view DRAM as the disk that you're talking to, and a B tree actually makes a lot more sense. B tree is a pain in the butt to implement, but with Rust, you can just use it. You don't have to actually know any of the implementation details of it. And as a result, it outperformed my C, in large part because of the data structure, but also because there are optimizations that Rust can make that, that, that C could not make. Um, and then, of course, everyone's like, wow, that's a GCC issue. How about Clang? I'm like, Clang is not going to fundamentally change the physics of my C, which it doesn't. It, like, Clang makes it a little bit better. This is the, the lower is better here. Um, so th this was really interesting to me. And it, it, it shows the, the kind of the core values of Rust. Um, so yes, performance. It has to be performance at kind of the epicenter of the universe, but you get that composability, the expressiveness that you in the Scala world have had for a long time. We now get this to have this at a much lower level. We get safety, we get security, we get rigor, we get robustness, we get integrity, and very importantly, we get interoperability. And this is actually the difference between Rust and other languages that look somewhat similar is Rust's emphasis on interoperability. Rust does not aspire to rewrite everything in Rust. Rust is trying to cooperate with those systems that already exist. 
So it's not just ownership. Um, the, um, I know that, you know, I, and you would be right to be annoyed when a bunch of systems people discover algebraic types like it's a brand new invention. Um, it's like, hey, I just found out, like, I'm getting clean water out of the tap. I don't have to, but you're just like, yes, you knucklehead. Like, yes, you clean water. It's valuable. Like, your babies are no longer dying. It's amazing. Um, but algebraic types, okay, I, and I knew about algebraic types in the abstract, but to actually be able to see how algebraic types can be used for really concise error handling. You can make much more robust software. And again, you know this. I'm actually, I'm literally preaching to the choir, so next. Um, but algebraic types are amazing, and they are amazing for reasons beyond what I appreciated. Um, hygienic macros, true story, I did not know how to spell hygienic before Rust. Hygienic is kind of a pain in the butt. You got that second I in there, like what's that doing there? But the, the, I, I have been so far from hygienic macros that I literally didn't know how to spell it. Um, now, macros are key for us in C. We use the C preprocessor all the time. I could not have written the code that I've written in my career without C preprocessor. Macros are very important. The macros in Rust are amazing. The foreign function interface is what allows it to interact with C-based systems. It's outstanding. And then there's this unsafe keyword, which is this kind of get out of jail, uh, kind of. It's a little more like a furlough program. You get to go, it's like a conjugal visit with your memory. Um, you don't actually. Um, Sometimes these metaphors occur to me on the fly, and I realize, like, as it's going out of my mouth, the other part of my brain's like, "No, let's kind of let's pull that one back, please." Pull okay, that one's gone. All right, fine, never mind. It's been it's been tweeted. Forget it. Um, but the um, the unsafe keyword allows you to relax certain restri restrictions that Rust puts in place that allows you to then, in very isolated parts, actually leverage what you know of memory and to build even higher performing things, better things. But you really can find that unsafety. So I think actually the unsafe keyword is terrific. Terrific community, thriving ecosystem. I mean, there's a lot to love about it. Um, so that's the promise of Rust. Um, there, there is, uh, it, and I made, I made reference to this last night, but I, the, the beauty of Rust is that it shifts the cognitive load back from software when it's running in production to the developer in development, which is great news if you're me. Um, I think great news if you're us. But it means if you're the developer in development, you're like, where did all this cognitive load come from? Like, I, I'm much more used to being able to just kind of like push it into production. But you know, there's a lot more cognitive load, a lot more things you need to think about. And Rust complains about things that seem very, very, very pedantic. And it can take a while to realize that, oh, Rust is right. Actually, Rust is right. There's an actual real issue here. Um, and there are a couple instances where people are convinced they're having a fruitless argument with the compiler because the compiler is wrong and they realize the compiler is actually right. So um, it's really interesting in that regard. It restricts what we can do. It can be very, very frustrating. This is a quote from, uh, from the Programming Rust book, which I love, um, that they, you have a period of intense arguing with the compiler, at the end of which the code looks rather nice, as if it had been a breeze to write and runs beautifully. But he, there's no way that code is like, you don't get the screams of pain that the developer had in getting that, that kind of beautiful code, that beautiful artifact. So the, the, the peril of Rust um, is that it, it's got less of an advantage, I think, when we are re-implementing extant systems. So when the software already works, it's less clear to me, especially if you've got multiply owned data structures like an OS kernel. Um, I think that's gonna be brutal for Rust, but there are a lot of opportunities for Rust. I'm sorry to kind of speed through here at the end, um, but there are a lot of opportunities for Rust because of its interoperability as a core value. God bless that interoperability and performance as a core value because it allows us to do with Rust what we did with C, which is to take an iterative approach Start rewriting things in Rust. We don't have to rewrite the entire world in Rust. We can start rewriting parts of Rust. And I think this is something that the Scala community really gets from its interoperability with Java, but I think we're really learning it in system software. Um, and so I think it's, it's a new dawn of development in that regard. The system is obviously much, they're much broader than just the operating system. There are a lot of user level components that are a natural fit for Rust. If I were writing systemd today, I mean, I didn't write systemd. Um, but if one were writing, I shouldn't even mention system B. If one were writing a user level facility to manage software as a service, the, 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 um, I would write that in Rust, um, absolutely. And in particular, just to close with the other body of software that I really want to see rewritten is the software that you can't see and I can't see and none of us can see. The software that works beneath us is firmware. Um, I, I've been fond of saying, but I, and I believe it fervently, that we are engaged in a war with firmware. It is humanity versus firmware, and everyone needs to pick a side. So I hope that you pick the side of humanity, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to rewrite that lowest level of software, which honestly is still an assembly or C. I think there's a lot of opportunity to rewrite that. 
um, in Rust. So I think the, you know, the, the, one of the things that the Rust community says over and over again is we can have nice things. Um, and I think that that is very much borne out by Rust values. The values themselves are a great fit for system software. It doesn't mean it's a fit for everything. Um, and you shouldn't let anyone try to convince you that it's a fit for everything. It's not, but for certain bodies of software, and in particular, the software that I like to write, it's a great fit and really liberating. And I think we're gonna see a lot of system software written in Rust. With that, thank you very much. Yeah, I, don't I have like negative five minutes for no, questions? You got, you got just spot on to okay, I, I, yeah, I, I'm happy to take a question or two. Yes. Uh, does Rust help you out with uh, like memory safety when you're doing the C there up stuff? Yeah, so th that's a great question. And I mean, clearly, like, it, it, if when you're talking to C, C can clearly be zero your address space. I mean, th so it's, um, Rust, is go Rust is going to help you out with the safety of your code. But when you need it, I mean, so for example, if you want to call MMAP, um, the, the, which is, allows you to actually mmap a, an object into your own address space, that's an unsafe operation. So you will need to wrap that in on safety. I think wh what it's doing is confining that on safety such that you're aware of it. So it does help you out in that it limits it as opposed to like letting that poison an entire application. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Any other, other questions? Yes. So what do, you, what do you think of the idea of, I know you talked about systems programming, but there's other spaces where those values that you talk about are yeah. also very important, such as in, in high performance you know, code. Yes. You know, where, where safety, robustness, and performance are all really critical, right? Do you see a role for Rust, not just the, the system software, but for example, like um, cooperating with the JVM, or as some kind of native library, and, and where you can combine the two, the two ecosystems to get the best of both worlds? Absolutely, and I'd say any place where these values are important, Rust is gonna have a place. Um, and in particular, where these are the choices you wanna make, and in particular, in particular, where performance is, the, is your top choice. If, if performance is your overarching value, I think Rust is, is absolutely gonna have a place. All right, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank you.